old school. So I wanted to talk a little bit about connecting your social media profiles and connecting your website to your social media profiles and automating that. And there are so many different ways to automate that that I couldn't possibly you know, discuss them all today. I wouldn't even try to put them all into a cheat sheet. But I want to start out with sort of the theory behind it. Why would you automate any of your social media? Might seem simple, but why? Laziness. All right. Well, what are you what are you saving? I mean, saving time. What else? Well, if you automate it, you can actually uh, manage the workflow such that you can manage what gets out there and filter things that you don't want. I don't know if you would trust them to do the. Uh, but that's not automating it because then you're you're filtering it. So you're no. Not if you've automated what's doing the filtering. Okay, all right. So I'm not exactly sure what you're saying, but I'm going to say robots. It sounds, like, it sounds like you have a robot doing the work for you. But another thing I think is just the, the mental work of doing the task of knowing what you have to post and where and just saving yourself a little bit of mental work having to remember what social networks you're using and where you want to post your content every time you post something on your website, now you have to remember, oh wait, I also have to post it on Facebook and I also have to post it on Twitter. I mean, has anyone had that frustration where like Google Plus comes out, for example, and now you think, oh great, now it's another network that I have to set up, find friends on, maintain connections with people, and post my content to. And, you know, you might not post the same content to every social network. So there's no button to shut this screen down, so we're going to do that. So you might have something like this, where you have your blog, and you might not call it a blog, especially if it's a business site. Maybe you call it news and updates or something. But if it's displaying regularly updated content in reverse chronological order with the newest at the top, especially if it has an RSS feed, then that's really technically speaking, it's a blog. And you post to it, but every time you post to it, you also want it to go to Twitter. And you also want it to go to Facebook. And maybe then Google Plus came out, and so, damn it, you added Google Plus as well. And uh, not only that, but you've got a Pinterest account that some, so we'll put a question mark there, some of the posts go to Pinterest if they're, you know, visually uh, interesting and they have a photo that you want to pin. Um, maybe some of your stuff is newsworthy, so you want to put it on Dig and Reddit and Delicious. So some of it goes there and even to PR Web, which puts it out as a press release. And then we also can't forget email over here because people are still using email and many of your readers don't even know what an RSS feed is. So they need to have a subscription to email. You can't forget email. And you can't even really leave out way back here print. You might still have a print newsletter that goes out. Let's say you have a monthly newsletter. You should be taking your content from your, your blog, your news, your homepage, and let's say the last month's worth of content using that in your newsletter. If something's going out uh, in your newsletter that's not in your blog, then you're doing something wrong. That should be in both. So, this is the reason why you automate some things, because that's a heck of a lot to remember to do every single time, and to have to do. Well, the first step in managing something like this would be to draw something like this, probably a little nicer, maybe do it on a computer, and uh, you could do it as a flowchart, or do it as a checklist, but to have that every time you post, and you might have a list that says, is it this kind of post? Then post it here, cross post it here. Is it this kind of post? Cross post it here. That way, you take out a lot of the mental work from having to post, from having to remember every single time you post. 
But to add to taking away some of that mental work from you, we want to possibly automate some of this. Maybe we automate going to Twitter and Facebook. Maybe we can even automate going to G+. Some of these things we can't automate. Most things you can find some kind of plug to automate. Does anyone have any reasons that you wouldn't want to automate, aside from what I already mentioned? The only thing, I definitely agree with that, but like, what about optimizing for each network? Like, throwing a hashtag into your Twitter, or not putting a hashtag on Facebook, like, right. for each service. Right, exactly. So, that's what I want on the computer for, and we'll bring up my own Twitter account. as an example of tweets that, uh, had I automated some of these, they would go to Facebook just like this. And it's easy to connect your Twitter and Facebook. In fact, it's native to the application. You do it right in the application to connect them. If you want to contribute to the social media conversations from hashtag, what is that hashtag doing on Facebook? It doesn't do anything on Facebook. It just sits there. It's not clickable. What is this at symbol doing on Facebook? Point Park University probably has a Facebook page. And there might even be, a, there probably is a tech now presence on Facebook as well. But if I'm using these hashtags and at symbols that they are on Twitter, when they go to Facebook, they lose all of their functionality. And they don't mean anything. And I've heard from many people who said, I don't understand why people are using hashtags on Facebook. Well, they're not using hashtags on Facebook. They're using them on Twitter, but they're automating that. The other reason you might want, not want to do this is, these are all just 140 characters versus what you have on Facebook. Uh, I'm, I'm not using a lot of slang, but you've seen people on Twitter who shorten words, use slang, abbreviate things because they only have 140 characters. Here's an example right here. I mean, built in PGH. Maybe if she put that on Facebook, maybe she would write built in Pittsburgh, but she's saving herself some characters. I mean, that's a tamed example. You know, sometimes people use seriously short and slang on Twitter, which would look ridiculous on Facebook because you can actually type what you want to write on Facebook. Then there's the issue of share preview images. If you wanted to share a link on Twitter, you just, you know, you share the link and then someone has to click on it. And we're not locked in on that computer, but someone has to actually click on the link and go to it. Whereas on Facebook, you can share a link and it has that nice share preview image. It looks a lot more professional, and it's a lot more usable to those people that you want to click it. So there are different options uh, for posting on different networks, and you really want to optimize that. Any other reason why you might not want to automate, you're worried about automating, or you've had issues automating? OK. There are couple of other options for automating besides just connecting those Facebook and Twitter accounts. When we talked about not forgetting about email, and not even forgetting about print for that matter, there are some really great tools for automating that. For automating to email, there are a couple tools that I really like. Um, they're called RSS to email tools. And years ago, I tested out a bunch of them, basically every one that existed at the time. Uh, the one that I found that I liked best, there's not much purple left, so we'll switch to red, <laughs> at the time was called Feedlets. It's an alternative to FeedBurner, um, but in which FeedBurner optimizes your RSS feeds, but it, it, I was using it more for its ability to automate the process of going from a blog to email, which means that I can offer a subscription on my website for people to subscribe to the blog content by email. Anytime I posted, they would get it in their email. It also had configurable options where people could decide to uh, get the content immediately as it was posted, get uh, you know once a day update or, or once a week uh, updates from me. And you can also subscribe, my users can subscribe even by uh, Twitter and by their social networks. So this is the way, you could really say Feedlets is another way to connect your RSS to your Twitter and your Facebook, but that's, those are individual user configurations. Recently, or more recently than that, 
the mail service MailChimp has come out with an RSS to email feature as well. These are the two that I like to use and I was going to show you but we're having issues with the computer so the interface on Feedplits is not as smooth as the interface on MailChimp. Um, don't be scared when, when you log in and find that it's not incredibly user friendly. Um, it's a great tool, very powerful tool. I would decide between these based on whether or not I have an existing email campaign. If I'm already using MailChimp for email, first of all, that's an easy choice. Then use it for this as well. Um, if you're using another program for email, then you know maybe eBlitz might be the easiest to set up. I really like MailChimp now because I can do this automated RSS to email, but also do email campaigns, send out other emails that aren't uh, from my website RSS feed, from my blog, or I can even do like a monthly or a weekly email newsletter that contains uh, summaries of the past posts from my blog, as well as still offering the uh, on-demand feed. Now, what's really cool and what kind of prompted me to want to do this session is that MailChimp has even more recently come out with a plugin called Social. So we're running out of red too, but that says social. Is it MailChimp social or just social? It, it's it's social by MailChimp basically. So if you if you Google social plugin MailChimp, it's a WordPress plugin that automates the process of going from your blog and your new your newsfeed, your website, uh, to Twitter and Facebook. And I just talked about why you don't want to automate going to Twitter or Facebook. Well, why am I so excited about MailChimp? And now I actually will have to log on and show you this because it's a semi-automated process. And bear with me as I log into my account here because I'm going to have to remember my email. And I probably won't the first time. What it does is every time you post that wasn't it. You can automate it so that every time you post, I'm not logging it. Every time you post, <laughs> it it will post your blog uh, post to Twitter and Facebook. But the best part is that it gives you the option before it actually posts to edit. So when I hit publish, I get a screen that shows my account on Twitter, my account on Facebook, and the different accounts that I have it set up to connect to. And it'll show the message that's going out to each of those. So I can go and click edit, and I can edit the tweet to be whatever I want before it goes out. So if I want it to be completely automated, then I just go post and then I click again, post again to send it to, or it's called broadcast, to send to my social networks. But I have the option of going and tweaking it. And I almost always do tweak it. Because sometimes I tweet something and I'll bring up my Twitter account again. And you know I want it to be just the, uh, just the title of the post. I'm using it right now for bloomfieldnow.com, which is local CDC. Oops, not .com in the Twitter address. And so we'll see some of the tweets that came out of this. In this case, I just use the title and then the link. Uh, same here, I use the title and then the link. By default, it uses the title and a little bit of the text uh, and then the link, and if the text is more than 140 characters, it'll get cut off, and so I don't really like how that looks. You know, I don't like any text that's cut off. So I always edit it. Sometimes it's just the title, sometimes it's just the text. You can even write different text for Twitter than you would elsewhere in the link. And you'll notice these are Bitly links. Uh, Bitly is a link shortener. Uh, you use it to sh literally shorten your links. Uh, normally these would be bloomfieldnow.com slash Highmark dash W P A H S dash you know blah blah blah. It's a long link, so you use these services to shorten your links so they fit in a microblogging service like Twitter. But the other reason you use a service like Bitly is because if you and it's free. There there are pro accounts, but you could also get a free account. 
you can use it to track the number of hits that you get, the number of clicks that you get on that link and where those are coming from so you can see we're getting this much traffic from Twitter, or we're getting, you know, when I tweet at this time of day, I get this much traffic at this time. I mean, you can use it to track so many different analytics. So I'm personally using Bitly. There are other services out there. Bitly's one of the oldest ones. Uh, WordPress generates its own short links, but, and, and this plugin, this social plugin, will use the built-in WordPress short links. However, if you install a Bitly plugin, then those will circumvent the WordPress short links, and this plugin will use those. So what I'm doing here is I'm getting all the power of Bitly and all the power of automation still with the ability to customize. It's really the best of, of all worlds. The one feature that I would like is when it does use your text, if it would use your excerpt instead of the actual text from the blog post. Um, when you write a post on WordPress, you have the option of writing a short excerpt beneath it, and it won't actually take that text, it takes the main blog post text, but that's a small consideration. Like I said, I wish I could show you a little bit more of the internal workings of that, but we're having the computer issues and I can't remember my password because Firefox does that for me. Uh, are there any questions? I know some of the, the technical issues probably went above people's heads, but some people were nodding along, so I'm assuming. So I assume there's nothing along the lines of something that would, when it's blasting out these feeds, be able to do things like translate a reference to somebody into a Facebook tag of them and a Twitter mention of them. Well, a Twitter, the mention, a Twitter mention, right, no. Well, I've never seen like, anything that can translate right, a Twitter mention into a Facebook out. mention. Okay. Well, because that program would have to know yeah. Yeah. the person. You have to give me the ability to link those things. <laughs> well, yeah, you, this is certainly this. you could do that. And that's a plugin that you know someone should create. So <laughs> maybe by next podcast. Um, but yes, you can use this to at someone or hashtag something on Twitter. Because the way Twitter works is you just write that and then Twitter creates the link from what you wrote. The way Facebook works is if you want to at Dave Mansueto over there, I gotta write at Dave, and as I'm typing it, Facebook will say Dave Mansueto, and I'll click on that and it'll create a link to Dave's name. That only works if you're on the Facebook <laughs> site. So it doesn't work even from your iPhone and Facebook app unless it's updated since yesterday, which it may have. Uh, it won't work in this either. So. Uh, if you if you want to link to someone using this, you still have to do it the old-fashioned way. Don't broadcast it. You would just uncheck it so you wouldn't broadcast that, and then you just go and copy and paste and, and write it yourself. And that's the other thing that I want to point out. It doesn't take that much time to write a Facebook post. Oftentimes, when I'm using Hootsuite, which Hootsuite is a service that uh, can connect many of your different social networks, and you can post the same thing to, oh, I can post one post and post it to Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, other networks as well. But I usually don't do that. I usually don't do that because it doesn't take that much longer for me to go in and post it directly to Facebook. And another benefit, this isn't really this topic, but another benefit to posting directly to Facebook is um, there's been some evidence that posts from third parties aren't weighed as heavily by Facebook and don't get seen by as many people than if you post directly to Facebook. Any other questions? Um, so WordPress you use just with your Facebook or can you, you, it connects all your, um, all your accounts? Well, are you, uh, are you talking about Hootsuite? Well, what, I guess what's the difference between, between WordPress, WordPress and, and Hootsuite? Suite? Well, I'm using WordPress as my back end for my, really a content management system okay. for my site, right? Okay. It's a blogging tool that has become much more and is now a content management system. Um, so because I'm using that for my site, I'm using WordPress plugins like social that connect that to Twitter and Facebook. Hootsuite is a little different, a lot different. Actually, Hootsuite isn't a content management system. It doesn't, it doesn't create content for your website. It's a way for you to manage your social networks. And I think the, the greatest use of Hootsuite is its ability to, to monitor your social networks. You can create lists. Um, they don't have to be official Twitter lists, I mean, you can create your own aggregated list of people that you want to follow more than others. So you might have your mainstream, but then you might have the people that you don't want to miss a single thing they say, so you put them in a separate stream, you know. Um, and you can switch back and forth between, you know, Facebook and Twitter, and you can, you can organize things how you want. So that's for you to listen with that tool, but you can also use that tool to broadcast. So you can do kind of what we're doing here and post to Twitter and Facebook at the same time, but that doesn't tie into your blog. The social plugin is really when you want to take your blog or your newsfeed, or, you know, whatever you call it on your website, 
and brought and helped to broadcast that out to Twitter and Facebook. Is there a cost for WordPress? Mm -hmm. No, WordPress is completely free. Uh, there are two sites, there's WordPress.com and WordPress.org. And the difference is WordPress.com is just like going to blogspot.com and signing up for a blog. Uh, completely free. Uh, your blog will be hosted, whatever the name you give it, dot, dot wordpress.com. WordPress.org is if you have a little bit of web design or web development knowledge or have someone to do this for you, you go and you download it and upload it to your server. And then you install it on your server. So uh, <laughs> if you went to bloomfieldnow.com, or for that matter, AvenueDesignStudios.com, these are both running WordPress on their own server. And um, if you have design skills or you know can uh, choose a template, there are thousands of free templates available. And then there are also paid templates available that allow you to customize a little bit more. Or you can hire someone like me, who's a designer, to design you a custom template. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, if anyone ever tells you that a WordPress site has to look a certain way, that's BS. Uh, that's like saying a, a Lego house needs to look a certain way. You can, you can really make it look any way you want. And with the amount of plugins there are available and the ability to customize, you can make it do anything you want. I mean, these two sites look completely different, both built on WordPress and, you know, as many examples I can show you. So is there a, a plugin or a media manager or content manager that will let you go across let them find you it's hard to find when that crosses. There's the Facebook, Twitter, and then way over here on the other end is Google Plus. Right, right. And, and granted, they're used for different things and there's different, uh, I guess, people that are on them, but when you do have something that would be applicable across all three, is there, and granted, like you said, it takes another minute to bring up one. That, right. But, but, it does take a so that's, that's why we want to automate as much you know, as we can, so we don't have to take as we, you know, those minutes every excuse me, every time we post. Um, social, for example, just does these two. It doesn't do Google Plus. Uh, will it ever do Google Plus? Well, Google Plus is so similar in ways to Twitter and Facebook that I would imagine that, that might be in the works. Um, if I don't use Google Plus extensively, so my knowledge on on any of this is very limited, but I imagine there's probably another plugin that you can get to automate that the same way. But when looking for plugins, I would specifically try to find something that allows you to edit the post before it goes. Are you are you talking about automatically posting to Google Plus after you publish the work? Cross posting, automatic cross posting. I just started using if if this then that, mm -hmm. which is not a plugin, but it's a service that says if if this one thing happens, then do this. Right. And I think it works great, and you can customize it in any number. Of, I'm just throwing that out because I've yeah. tried a lot of the plugins, and they haven't. It does something, well, but not the other. But it's ifttt is the website, and you can create thousands of different. They call them recipes. Right. So it, the solution might be outside of WordPress. Right. So that's a site where you go, you sign up, you log in to Twitter and Facebook, and connect them all on Google Plus. And it's not a plugin. You're just giving it the rules that say, if I put, what, what what are some of the rules? Like if I post about this topic or use this hashtag. Yeah, I've actually been using it to go from. So I used to have Tumblr push content to Facebook, right. and now I've turned that upside down. Um, so when I post something on the Facebook page, it updates the Tumblr. Page. Right. The problem is, if you're using it for your website and you're using IFTT. It's not going to rewrite your post for Twitter and Facebook. So if you want to include hashtags and at symbols, you would still have to do that manually. Correct. And it, it's probably a great tool. Like I said, there are so many different ways to, to automate this. But I just get really excited about social because it's that perfect balance between automation and customization. And like I said, it's made by MailChimp. It's not made by a single developer who's going to disappear or you know or, or get burned out in a year and is not going to be supported anymore. And so, because it's also made by Mailchimp, uh, one thing I love about both of these services really is the ability to customize your emails to look like your your website to really brand them. Um, you can 
even there's Mailchimp is free, but you can upgrade to a pro account, which removes the logos and gives you some more branding options. Uh, so you can customize the heck out of your email, and then now you can use that same customized email to go to, you know, when you email your your list, as well as when they get an RSS feed. You know, every time you post, or sorry, when they get an email from your RSS feed, every time you post, they're getting a branded email from your company. And obviously, when I talk about branding, I'm more talking about it in terms of using uh, what you're using this for business, using social media for business. I mean, there's personal branding, but if you're personally branding your uh, your emails, you know, then you're probably famous. Like this guy. What's up? Hey. Are you kicking us out? Because I no, think no, you no, have I'll like. Check out my camera. Okay. Man, over here. We 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 have the wrong dongle. Yeah. Yeah, we have we have a male dongle. We need a female dongle. Oh. Yeah. I don't know what to do about that either. But that's what Derek said. I don't know where Derek went. So, anyway, any other questions? Early. Hey, we're just talking about dongles. Do you have any other questions? I don't. Have you covered everything you intend to cover? That's really it. Other than well, that, I wanted to actually show you some of the configuration options within. I did uh, have the a package. question about print. Okay. And namely, you, what are you using to, to generate print? Or what? So the problem. Let, let me let me explain what the background is. Okay. So Gwen and I, because I foolishly opened my mouth, now publish a quarterly newsletter for a nonprofit. Um, um, turns out publishing a quarterly newsletter is a huge pain in the ass. Yeah. yeah. Um, so at the moment, I, I have a rather badly washed up template um, for Microsoft Word that I'm that I'm filling in every right. every three months to do this. And you know, the thing is, I don't actually need to do it electronically as well. I really only need to generate print because what I'm doing is I'm generating the print and then I'm also mailing out a PDF of the thing that was printed. Right. But I'd rather do something different. I'd rather I'd rather email out something that made more sense electronically right. and then have something that's printed that makes sense for the people that, that get printed by. Right, and and that's that's my philosophy on, on using print and using a website is that your, your information should be going out faster and more frequently updated online, but then you take that and you, you can't you know, unless you're sending out a daily newspaper, you can't have that frequency in print. So you uh, you kind of aggregate the content from the past month or quarter in your case, and then put out what's still relevant. Well, no, in I don't case, know. It's all still relevant, but good. Then it's all still relevant, but I still don't know any way to automate that. Um, okay. I've looked into plugins for WordPress that did that, that would take your content and lay it out uh, in like a, a newsletter format, and I found nothing. Uh, okay. Yeah, I I. I'm actually kind of working with someone to develop a product that does something like this, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Uh, that really is kind of an untapped market at this point. You said for the services that you can upgrade, they're free, but then you can go pro. Are the ones that go pro, are they typically a, a monthly, a yearly, a one-time payment? Um, or? With MailChimp, it depends on, on how many people are on your mail list. I think the same thing with people. I think that's pretty much any email service is uh, your monthly rate is based on your number of subscribers. Um, with most plugins, for like WordPress plugins, I don't think there's a pro versus a free version of social. I think it's all free now, but let's say they do come out with a pro version. Most plugins seem to be a one-time payment. Is that your experience? I mean, you're kind of in that world as well. Plugins tend to be like a one-time payment. Me? I was looking at Dave. Oh, oh. Either way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm. I'm a newbie on plugins. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I would say email is usually a monthly, a monthly fee. And it seems to if you have heard to the upgrades and pros, that monthly, really one time. Yeah, monthly. Oh. That would be monthly. And it's it's usually worth it, especially if you have a smaller account to upgrade to pro. Like most of my clients, when we get started out, you know, they have such a small email list that. It's easy to say, let's go pro, because you get rid of this logo and you can fully customize the email. But on the other hand, it's not the worst thing in the world to have a free account and to have a little MailChimp logo on your email. I mean, I'm sure you get email like that from businesses all the time and you don't think any less of them. Have you worked with Tiny Letter at all? No, is that an email service? 
I haven't used it. It's by the Mailchimp people, and it's supposed to be like super simple. I okay. mean, I think Mailchimp is pretty easy, but it's still like it's very robust. Heavy. Yeah. Um. So I, I've been wanting to try it. Just wondering if anybody here had used it. Tiny it's letter. A tiny letter. And it's like a subset of Mailchimp. It's like subservice. Yeah, it's not Mailchimp Lite. It's like a separate service, but it was designed to be dead simple. Okay. From what I've read, I haven't. Another reason to use the social plugin because the more the more uh, services you're using from Mailchimp, you know, the better it is to customize back and forth. Does anyone know? I'll ask questions to you guys now. Does anyone know of any other ways that you automate? Like, is anyone using something to automate pinters? I've always wondered about that. The API. I've, I've looked. The API is an open. You can't. Buy, okay. You can't automate. I mean, a, a Flickr Pinterest automation is something that is so obvious. I'm surprised it doesn't exist. There's a there's a for, there's a discussion about it on Quora. Right. And there are lots of people planning to come out with Pinterest automation things mm -hmm. yet, but the Pinterest API is. Uh, there is a Pinterest uh, button that you can put on your content, uh, and so this actually isn't part of the discussion or part of this topic. But since we have so much time. I also recommend putting share buttons on your website content. Share buttons like uh, post this to Facebook, share on Twitter. These are different than the little Twitter and Facebook icons that link to your profile, that link to your Facebook page, that link to your, your business's uh, Twitter profile. Uh, those are linking to your profile, but these share buttons are for people who are logged into Twitter, logged into Facebook to share your content on their account. And they have a similar one for Pinterest as well. So like a lot of um, Recipe sites, cooking sites will have a little Pinterest logo, and you would click on that, and it would already have the image all loaded up and the description ready to go. And I love to use those. If I'm going to share a news article, I always look for a share button first to see if it's available, because if it is, then it automates my process, but it also allows me to customize the tweet or the Facebook post before it goes out. And let's say um, the author of the content wants to use a specific hashtag for their content, they can set up those share buttons that when you click it, it automatically inserts that hashtag. Now I have the option of deleting it if I want, but that allows me to use the hashtag to connect with them that I may not have known about otherwise. Does anyone have any questions about other networks that we didn't include? Is anyone struggling with, hey, I've got these three networks that I try to con you know, post content to? Can you LinkedIn cannot be part of like if you have a Twitter oh, I or left Facebook, out, LinkedIn. I left out LinkedIn. Um, the way to connect, the way that officially you would connect a website to LinkedIn is uh, through a LinkedIn plugin that's that's basically available at LinkedIn, uh, where you you log into your WordPress credentials and it will post your posts in a little box on your LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. But that's with it's within its own constrained box, and you know it's your blog area. That's not actually posting updates. So doing this kind of thing, where we're actually posting real updates to Twitter, Facebook, G Plus, uh, there's nothing for LinkedIn right now. And I think I, I know I had my WordPress blog connected to LinkedIn, and I think it still might be. But the reason I don't know is because I find it so. Useless. I mean, once you, you're going to go on my LinkedIn page maybe once to say, hey, I know this guy, you know, let me read about him, we'll connect, right? You're going to maybe see that blog once. Once you go on my profile, you're probably not going to go back there too often, so you're not going to be seeing my blog because you're only going to see it if you're on my actual profile as opposed to me posting updates that are now in your stream because we're connected on LinkedIn. Well, you know how you're connected in groups on LinkedIn? Like, what if you wanted to send a specific but just kind of a general message to everybody in your group, like, right. hey, I need, you know, whatever, like, you're trying to source something. From well, this group. How do you, I mean, is there like a little, like a little message that can go out to the whole group? Because, like, like, obviously, LinkedIn, it could be expensive. I mean, well, no, you can send a message to a group, but I mean, that that's not an automated message that comes from your blog, okay. anyway. But, right. Yeah, the only the only way that I've seen to automate the blog to LinkedIn is to to use that plugin and like I said, it puts it in a little mm -hmm. square and it shows that this is this is your WordPress blog on your profile. Right, how 
how mobile friendly are, are these services to set up? To, to do this? Opinion. Yeah. Well, I mean, like the social plugin, you'd be using WordPress through the browser on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you were using like an email to blog, like WordPress where you can you can email a blog post and it'll go out. I don't know if that would also go to broadcast to your social networks. I'm not, I'm, I've never tried that, so I don't know. That's a good question. Look how annoying Microsoft. But I mean, as far as everything else, like, you know, RSS feed to email, it wouldn't matter whether you're posting mobile or not. It would all go out to those services. Um, now, if you were using IFTT, like Lindsay suggested, you would definitely, you, that, that wouldn't even be a consideration whether you're posting by mobile or posting on your desktop. Um, because that's a third party service and that would get sent out. Because I'm always, I, it drives me nuts managing, for example, our, our product page yeah. on Facebook and trying to <laughs> both switch back and forth between uh, blasting out information that and then trying to reverberate it with your you know, social right. personal accounts. That it's so much of, of the Facebook stuff um, can't be done, for example, uh, linking to other companies or pages right. on your page. You can't do that in mobile. You can't do that in mobile. No, yeah. you have to be on the actual, and you can't even, well, through the through the browser, if you're on Facebook through your mobile browser, can you, I don't, I, I don't think, think they that. hide it and it drives me crazy. Yeah. I'm trying to only use mobile. So you almost literally have to be on a, a Mac, a laptop or a desktop. It, it seems that. like an amazing, I guess it's an obvious thing because these, this typical, these connections, this is power, you you know, this is strong power stuff. This yeah. Is really making you know, the system worked for you. But it, it is, yeah, it's almost, I mean, it's very difficult to do for yeah. mobile. And I, and I still haven't, you know, I, w I wonder if, if in some ways do any of these plugins make, somehow make it easier from that perspective, from the mobile perspective, of blasting out that info. Right. And, um, well, with the, mobile, with the Facebook thing, with the Facebook thing, like, I don't know if there is a solution, but yeah. I, I do want to mention this because th this session is really about broadcasting and we touched on it, but you might also be interested in, you're kind of asking about like how to manage those different networks, not necessarily broadcast to them, but just manage them. You know, when you're on so many different networks and you're, you're mobile, how are you going to manage them on a phone? You know, how are you going to switch back and forth between, you can't switch back and forth between different tabs as easily mobile as you can, you know, in, in your, on your laptop. So Hootsuite is really useful. I think of it more as a listening station than anything meaning that I'm using it more to see what people are saying. You can use it to search. You can create saved searches. So if you wanted to search for podcast Pittsburgh 7, the hashtag, you can create that as a saved search, and then you'd see a stream of people. You know, anytime you opened up Hootsuite, you'd see that stream of people talking about PCPGH7. Um, but it, it is also a way to broadcast information. So like I said, it's not ideal because it will, it will send the same thing to Twitter and Facebook, but you don't have to send it at the same time. You can open up Hootsuite, write one thing, send that to Twitter, and then write something else and send that to Facebook, and then write something else and send that to LinkedIn. So you can customize every message, but use one tool to do it. TweetDeck only Twitter? TweetDeck is really the same thing. I mean, it's very, it's a very similar tool to Hootsuite. And... I don't know how many other networks there are. Is it just, do you know if it's just Facebook? I know Twitter? it's Twitter and Facebook. Um, LinkedIn might be included last time I used it. That's all I know. I feel like I hear it in this session, that they're going to be weekend, but it's yeah. Tweetdeck. Right. It used to be Tweetdeck. I think that Podcamp Pittsburgh 3, I think Tweetdeck was like, I think that's where I learned about Tweetdeck, actually. Um, and then, like, like, a year later, everything was Hootsuite, so. And that, but that being said, TweetDeck has updated since then. I've just never gone back and looked, so it might be a compliment. Do any of these test your links before it sends them out? No, I've never seen anything that would, would test your links. So test your links. Is there something that is comparable uh, from an audio perspective, like from a if you're doing podcasts and you want it to hit your blog, your Twitter, your Facebook, whatever that 
even though it's probably to, just going to send out the link to that right. podcast. That's what I was going to say. It would it would just be sending the link to the podcast, or if even if it was the direct link to the audio file. So there, is there anything, or would you just have to go into one of these and put in the link and then send it out that way? That well, right? I mean, let's say well, if you're using a blog to power your podcast, so that anytime you posted a new audio or video uh, episode of your podcast. It basically was in a blog post. You know, it, you you would use WordPress to create a title for it, embed, uh, you know, the, the file. And Dave can tell you more about the tools, the specific tools. I haven't been podcasting in a while. Dave's up to date with the newest tools for doing so. But it would still, it would actually still be an RSS feed, just like a regular blog, just like just like text. So we're still talking about that RSS get, getting sent to uh, email, getting sent to Twitter, Facebook, but it, it would be the link to the content. So WordPress would allow you to embed your, your basically your audio podcast, and then oh yeah, then Word, it would Word, just function like normal. Just WordPress is a great tool for audio and video as well, and, yeah. it, and it basically works the same way with RSS. And RSS stands for kind of stands for two different things, but it stands for the easiest is really simple syndication, and that's what you're doing. You're you're making it really simple to syndicate your syndicate your content and send it to various networks and allow people to subscribe to it. You want to recommend any tools for? I, I'm basically I'm kind of like a luddite with regards to things. What but what I would suggest is to make sure that wherever the link that you're sending them to is has is a friendly place that has a player. <laughs> That has the option to download a file, rather than because you know we've seen over the years of working at Libsyn and stuff like that. You know, the, there's different methods. Some people send you to a feed. Some people send you to a audio file. It's not a consistent experience, and in a way, that's a problem. Whereas, say YouTube, and I think I heard this a lot in other sessions. You send somebody to YouTube. Sorry, we're talking about it. It's like they're gonna, their grandma is gonna be able to get there. Right, you know, right. everyone's gonna get there. The guy that just got off the, you know from Martian land, from another planet, it's going to be able to view and consume the content. So as long as you provide a landing space that is that is an uncluttered landing space with a player and, and a couple of options and maybe the options to reverberate it, you know, by sharing it, that's the best way right. to go. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, and I think that's better than sending just the media file. But I, I think this, that this is still a problem that kind of needs to be solved because audio it's still not as friendly as YouTube. Maybe SoundCloud. I find myself nowadays you know, using using things like YouTube or SoundCloud over, even though I've got it in, in what I consider the democratized format, which is the podcasting RSS feed, because I think I'm going to get more impressions with a more friendly landing spot to listen and consume that audience. So you know, for the for the sake of you know all that's important with the internet, you know, I always make sure it's somewhere on an RSS feed in a democratized fashion, a non siloized meaning some other company owns your media option, but oftentimes I front put them on the front end the, uh, the silo-wise service representation on SoundCloud or even YouTube video, even when you're giving them audio. Yeah, the, the more popular services. When I first created our, our podcast, she was like, I want to do a podcast. And I'm like, all right, I read RSS feeds for dummies. I created a hand-coded XML file and I uploaded the audio files. Uh, the MP3 files and updated the XML file. Now, when anyone would go to our site and there was like a little section about the podcast, because I didn't think it was going to be big, this is before Podcast Pittsburgh One, you would have to copy and paste this URL and go to your pod reader. What did they call them back then? Pod catchers. Pod catchers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you'd go to whatever you know pod catcher you were using. I don't even know if iTunes. Well, I guess iTunes existed. And iTunes to, didn't exist yet. iPodder was the first. You you'd know. go to iPodder, right? And you post in the URL, and you would get every episode. And I thought, well, that's all people need. They need this just this one link to this XML file. Technically, that is all people needed. But no one's going to know to do that. So you know, when we redesigned the site later on. We used WordPress as a back end, and I looked at what a lot of other podcasters were doing. And back then, we had a million links down the side in the sidebar to all the different services you can subscribe to. Now there's just the one, you know, open in iTunes or, or go to YouTube. Uh, and that's another thing you do if you are trying to promote your content. You kind of do you agree with this? You want to kind of choose one or two networks to really promote it heavily on. You want to put it 
everywhere you can. You know, you want to put your video on as many video hosting sites as possible, but you're probably going to be promoting it on one or two more than the others. Because first of all, you don't have the time and energy to promote it on, on everything. And you want to find out where your audience is and promote that to headless. Anything else? That's pretty much all I wanted to cover. If you um, have any questions, I have cards. You can always email me about some of these tools. All right, and we're almost out of ink, so. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome.